Good afternoon and welcome to um, the second session in the DLD's track of um, sessions for uh, the 2020 Galileo Annual Conference. Um, before we get started, I just have a few announcements um, for you all. Um, participation certificates will be available on request and um, you can email uh, Dina Dot Anderson at usg.edu to request them. Um, both the slides and the recordings of this webinar will be made available and um, we will notify you via um, email when, that, when that's the case. I did want to um, take a moment to um, plug tomorrow's uh, webinar, which is part two of digitization on a shoestring. Um, that will be at 10 a.m. And um, our next uh, DLG webinar will be our second town hall of um, 2020 on July 18th. So this is an opportunity for you to um, hear about what DLG has been doing over the last six months. And also um, we'll have time for discussion on a topic selected by our attendees. So, um, I'd like to uh, introduce our speakers today. Um, Brenda Poku, the director of the Conyers Rockdale Library System, and Chandra Walker, the interim director of Georgia College's library. Um, they'll be speaking about building connections through community digitization events. Um, both of our speakers today were successful recipients of um, the National Endowment for the Humanities um, Common Heritage Grants, which center around uh, creating community digitization events. So without further ado, um, Brenda, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for attending this uh, webinar this afternoon. Um, I have had the wonderful pleasure of becoming the director of the Conyers Rockdale Library, Nancy Gwynn Memorial, here in um, Rockdale County. A little bit on my background. Um, I hold a degree in behavioral science from Lesley University out of Cambridge, Massachusetts, and my MLIS from Drexel in P Pennsylvania. I'm actually retired from uh, Aetna Life and Casualty in about 30 years. And what brings me to this special place on bringing, on building connections through digital community events uh, is I spent quite a number of years over in Africa and doing a lot of research on um, oral traditions and with a focus on literacy and the challenges, challenges that were, that are born of assumptive cultural information. So when I came on board with Nancy Gwynn Library, a um, uh, little bit of history. Uh, the project had been researched in 2017. I actually joined this project um, at the tail end. I was not part of the digitization process, but I was part of the evaluation of how the process went. So let's, can we go to the next slide? We're going to talk a little bit about the Common, common Heritage Grant. Uh, in Rockdale County, let me give you a little history here. Rockdale County is the second smallest county um, in Georgia. We have approximately 305 churches, last I think we took count. Our demographics uh, is um, varied, uh, however, predominantly African American, African American with about 91,000 folks in the county. Uh, so as you can see, um, we're really very small. And truth be told, we all know one another here in Rockdale County. And from a public library perspective, it allows um, the library to do a lot of things without jumping through um, the normal um, chains and things that, are, that will hang you up when you're looking to work on a project. The library is um, one of 
very few out of the Georgia Public Library System were a single system library. So we are the only library as we call ourselves the best deal in town. That being said, um, the library has had a long history of working with the Rockdale County Genealogy, Genealogical Society. And that's part of how the research was born. Um, through conversations, uh, it had really been brought to our light that with 305 churches in the community, there was not a lot of um, recorded or documented history uh, that was available to the public as the conversation took on more momentum and the library went after the grant, uh, the goal was to digitize or at least capture as much as they possibly could. Some of the rich history that was embedded within black churches in Rockdale County. So next slide. The good news. The good news is we won the grant. Um, or we were the recipient of the grant. The other good news is this was our first digitization project and we jumped off the cliff and survived. And when I say jump, we jumped head first. We had a lot of really wonderful training from the folks at the Digital Public Library, Georgia Public Library Ser Services, uh, of getting our folks up to speed. And, um, that is probably where we hang our hats on this project. Um, when, we, when we thought about conceptualizing the goal of this, we thought, okay, we would go out to a number, and I believe at that time we picked five churches, not 305, that's a little too many, but five churches we had targeted. And the library felt they had a reasonable familiarity with the churches, with the community, obviously, and in partnership with the genealogy, genealogical society. That's probably where all the good news stopped and um, the discovery started. So look, can we go to the next slide? I am quite passionate, if you will, about who is the messenger and why it matters. And just from um, doing a lot of research over in Africa, um, and obviously being part of the African American community, what I know to be true, and what we found out as part of the library, is that uh, many um, in the African American community, a lot of our history has been lost, a lot of our traditions are born anthropologically from oral traditions. So it wasn't very, it wasn't surprising to me in hindsight that a lot of this information was not captured and available to the public. If you can imagine, think about this. Uh, when you're asking to digitize uh, folks' pictures, their Bibles, you're really going into a culturally different world. These documents are often sacred. They tell the stories of families, of divorces, marriages, traumas throughout life, and they're very sacred. So that's where we backed up and I thought, well, gee, what was the library's cultural competence in doing this sort of project? And the truth is we had wonderful relationships in the community. In all honesty, I think we lack the cultural competence, the ability to understand and communicate and to effectively interact with people across cultures. Um, with the grant, we obviously um, were, um, we, we purchased um, digitization um, machinery, laptops, we had all the tools. And, and this is what's really important is that in order to be successful, what we lacked was the appropriate messenger to build the relationship. It was, I don't wanna say superficial, I think they were honest, but they were surface level deep. In other words, folks would come into the library, you know what that's like when you're browsing collections, they say hi, they tell you a little bit about your kids, but it is completely different when you ask folks to come into the public library, bring their Bible, because we wanna scan it, and um, expect that they're going to do that. Can we go to the next slide? 
So here's what we learned. We learned um, that while our intentions were well-meaning, we were ill-prepared. And I don't say this as a knock against the program. In all honesty, I, I applaud the library. I think they did a wonderful job of being up to speed and getting ready um, to take on their first digitization project. In terms of what was the outline, they absolutely had done wonderful planning, pre-planning, a lot of research. As a matter of fact, it went back into 2017 and came forward into 2018. Defining the scope of the project, uh, I, in all honesty, we didn't do that very well. Um, we essentially said, you know, bring us your pictures, your Bibles. Um, if someone had showed up with, you know, something other than a Bible in pictures, we did not define the scope. We didn't say what size materials, and these were the lessons we learned that in going out and doing a digitization project, I think it matters to be really specific. The other thing is um, we knew we were offering new technology into the community. And the goal was to leverage this technology. We were excited about that. However, despite all the training that was done for the staff in advance of the project, um, they really weren't prepared to take on um, this type of project. Oh, let me reframe that. They were prepared, but in all honesty, they all admitted they could have used more time to become more comfortable and familiar with the technology that they were gonna share and work with the community. Um, in terms of proficiency, it's, I think it's a fair um, assessment to say that they were pretty new at um, a lot of the tools that they had and they were working with. What it did afford, however, was um, a lot of opportunity um, for the users. We did provide opportunities for the community, especially um, the Black community, um, to come in and at least be aware of the technology that was available at the library. And there was a lot of rich conversations that happened uh, about what was inside of the library and people were unaware. Oftentimes when you're working with genealogists or folks doing um, um, research on, on their families and backgrounds, things like that, uh, they're asking the questions, but they're not really using the tools or they're researching databases. This was completely different. What we learned on the day of our project was that we had more conversations about what they could do than actual scanning of documents. So what it said to the library was that we needed to one, address our users' familiarity with the tools and get them up to speed and comfortable with what they could do with the tools. Um, the other thing is, I'm gonna go back to understanding the demographics and the culture of the community. I think where we wholly missed the mark, and if there's anything I want to emphasize in what I'm talking about today, it is, again, back to the messenger. It is one thing to have a professional or at least a, a friendly relationship with a community, it is something completely different when you're asking them to bring in some of their sacred, sacred documents because you want to scan them. Oftentimes, and, and I think I'm really speaking from experiential posture as an African-American woman, when you're dealing with, these are often older folks in our community are coming in and they're bringing in their Bibles. They often hold the um, church pamphlets for, for folks who had died in the family and they want to tell the story. And that's where the richness is at. Um, it's the ability to listen. It's not, in my estimation, it's not so much about the actual scanning process, while that is the goal, but the ability to capture the richness of the stories that are embedded in the pictures, in the documents, in the Bibles. And that's where I feel like we have a lot of work to still do um, in the community to bridge that divide. 
what I will say is at the end of the project, we had learned um, a lot about where we were lacking as a public library. We have since gone on and really scaled down um, where we wanted to focus next we have backed up and realized we need to get our community, especially our seniors or folks that are a little more wiser than we are, uh, get them up to speed on the technology, on digitization, on the language, on the tools itself. So what we did is we took bite-sized grants, bite-sized, um, yeah, bite-sized grants. We took <laughs> bite-sized chunks and just starting to do some small things with computer sessions and getting our community um, familiar. I am optimistic and hopeful that when we launch our next outing with digitization, that we're gonna be much more successful because of the things we have learned. Of course, we are thankful um, to the NEH for the um, Common Heritage Grant and also to the Rockdale County um, Genealogical Society. So that's it. Thank you, folks. Thanks, Brenda. We're going to um, take questions at the end, um, and I'm going to um, switch the controls over to uh, Chandra. Okay, um, so my name is Sandra Walker. I am the Interim Library Director at Georgia College, and I am delighted today to talk to you about um, a project that we engaged in called Documenting African American Millersville. So about quick note about Common Heritage, and Sheila has already mentioned a little bit about it, but basically, it's an NEH uh, program that supports community digi digitization and outreach events with a goal towards increasing public awareness as well as the care and maintenance of heritage collections that are in the public. The title of our project was Documenting African American Millersville. And just to give you a little background and context, Millersville is located in central Georgia. Um, it is home to Georgia College and State University. It is also the home of um, Central State Hospital, which at one time was the largest mental health facility in the world. Um, Millersville also has a distinction of being Georgia's antebellum capital. One of the things that we noticed um, that was missing in terms of local history is that there has not historically been a lot of information about the African American community in Millersville. And so there was a real need to document that history, particularly as individuals are aging, memories are fading, um, those types of things. So there was a real need um, to document that history. So the focus of our project was specifically on documenting the African-American community. Um, there were a couple of themes within the African-American community that we really want to focus on. And those included um, education, Millersville was home to an American Missionary Academy school called the Eddy School. So there's a great deal of pride around education. Um, some derivatives of Eddy School were Carver High School, which was a um, public high school for African Americans. Of course, as was mentioned in the previous um, presentation, it's a lot of history and significance around the African American church particularly Flag Chapel Baptist Church, which was um, established by a free um, black man, Wilkes Flag. Um, and then of course, in a segregated society, you're also going to have um, a lot of black businesses. And so those are all significant um, institutions within the African American community that we sought to feature. This is a postcard from one of our advertisements. And really quickly, um, I'll just point out a couple of individuals of significance. Um, this is a group, um, a music group from Millersville called the Mighty Chevelles. Um, they did not receive a lot of recognition in the United States, but 
they seem to have a cult status um, in Europe and they came out of Millersville. This is Reverend um, Wilkes Flagg, who was the free African-American um, man who established Flagg's Chapel Baptist Church. This is Sally Ellis Davis, who was um, a historic educator who was associated with the um, Eddy School. We have a photograph of a civil rights pro protest here that took place in front of um, the Millersville City Hall. And then these are some of our African-American uh, Vietnam era veterans. This lady, her first name is Nancy and it's escaping me right now, but she was actually a lead singer for the Mighty Chevelles. And so this is just some of that really significant history that comes out of Millersville that we wanted to highlight. Um, the original project dates for our project were January of 2019 through June 2020. However, due to COVID, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, we had to get an extension on the grant and it's been extended through um, June 30th of 2021. So, planned activities, and again, I'll talk about this a little bit later. In our grant application, we primarily focused on the following activities. The first one was a workshop called Caring for Your Her Family Heritage Mat Materials. Um, we planned to do two history harvest days. Um, we planned a community uh, history panel and then an exhibit to come out of um, what was collected from the history harvest days. So um, these are a couple of photographs from our workshop. Um, the workshop was held at Allen's Market, which is a significant. Um, location to the African-American community in Millersville. The historic African-American business district in Millersville is referred to as the Strip, and Allen's Market is no longer functioning as a business, but it's owned by a nonprofit called Allied Arts. And so it's a place where you frequently have community gatherings. It's accessible and it's familiar to the community. So that was one of our strategies. We wanted to make sure that we actually went out into the community instead of asking the community to come to us, to make it comfortable, to make it welcoming, and to make it convenient. Our speaker for our workshop was Shanae Murain. Um, at that time, she was a university archivist at the University of West Georgia. She's now the community manager at the Digital Public Library of America. And that was another strategic decision. Um, again, Shanae at that time was a university archivist at the University of West Georgia. But she had also participated in a very similar project up in um, the Douglasville area um, that focused on digitizing African American history in that community. I met Shanae at a conference. I actually moderated a panel that she was on, and that's kind of where I got this idea from. So I knew she was very familiar with what we wanted to do. Um, Shanae, in addition to having her MLIS, Shanae also has a Master's of Divinity degree. And so she was very familiar with the African-American church, African-American religion, and just the African-American community in general. And so considering the community that we wanted to reach out to, based on her experience as well as her education, she was a really good fit for that. Um, looking at the pictures here now, we gave out some um, care kits, for lack of a better word. They have some gloves in them, some um, pencils. We had acid-free paper, some erasers. Um, participants were able to come out and get, um, they were actually able to bring in materials that they wanted consultation on. So if they had something that was fragile or delicate and they weren't quite sure um, what to do with it, uh, Shanae and other uh, individuals were on hand in order to give consultation on how to care for those materials. And then, of course, here's a picture um, of Shanae with one of our community members. We had a really good turnout, um, a mixed, very diverse group of individuals. We had people come from out of town, um, very racially um, diverse group, people from the college, people from the community. So it was just a really, really um, good time. So next, um, our first History Harvest Day took place back on October the 5th. And it was at uh, the Collins P. Lee Center, which is located in the historic uh, Harrisburg community in Milledgeville, historic African-American community. Uh, the Harrisburg community sponsors a, an annual community festival called the Harrisburg Festival. It usually takes place in the fall. 
And so that was really our first stab at the History Harvest Day. Um, these uh, photos show a couple of our project participants. This is um, Evan Levitt, who is just a wonderful addition to our faculty and staff at Georgia College. Um, he is uh, gifted in many areas, and he was on hand to assist. He's here with one of our community um, participants. And then we also were able to get our, um, one of our graduate students involved. This is Jarvis, and he is working with one of our uh, participants on doing some scanning. The, our first History Harvest Day was not as successful in terms of turnout as we would have liked um, in terms of us actually doing scanning. Um, it was a very, very busy day, lots of activity. Um, Harrisburg, people come back from out of town who came out of that community. There's eating and dancing and socializing. And so that was probably one of our lessons learned. Maybe not the best match for the History Harvest Day, but what I will say is that there were some really um, significant and important conversations that came out of that meeting. So we had opportunity to talk, to meet people, and I think anytime you're doing a project like this, but especially when you're doing one with a community that has traditionally been marginalized, trust is a very, very important. And so you can't start out just asking people for their artifacts or asking um, them to share things with you. You really have to develop a relationship. And so in my opinion, while it was not as, as successful as we would have liked it to be in terms of scanning, it was an opportunity for us to demonstrate our commitment to the community, as well as just have some conversations and um, an opportunity for us to get to know each other a little bit better. So our second History Harvest Day was held at El Bethel Baptist Church, which is actually um, not very far from Georgia College, not very far from the library. We held that event on March 5th, which was, um, luckily we were able to get it in before um, the pandemic uh, started. And here, this is a photo of our digital archivist, Holly Croft, and she is here with a couple of our participants. Um, this partnership was meaningful in the sense that this gentleman right here is Mr. Melvin Bayman, and he is someone that um, we met prior to us even establishing um, the grant, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, but Mr. Bayman as well as a couple of other individuals have really served as ambassadors for us in terms of, again, helping to build that trust between us from the college and the community, as well as his just community knowledge. He's very well respected and he um, is a deacon at El Bethel. He was willing to open up the doors of the church for us. He helped to get the word out and he was just a wonderful um, asset uh, to us at the college. And again, here you've got a couple of participants and then you have our um, digital archivist, Holly Croft, who was a um, wonderful addition to the project and has really lended a lot of expertise to us um, as we move forward. So, challenges. <laughs> um, building trust, which I talked about a little bit earlier. Um, Georgia College is uh, Georgia's designated public liberal arts college. Um, Georgia College integrated in the mid-60s or so, and so a lot of the individuals um, who might have some of this community knowledge are individuals who may not have had the opportunity to attend Georgia College, and so that town-gown relationship is, um, has not always been what we would have liked, to have liked for it to have been. And so building trust is uh, important, and building trust is something that takes time. And so I think it's important, again, whenever you're dealing with marginalized communities, you really want to have a true, authentic, respectful relationship. Um, it cannot be transactional. Um, I was really attracted to the framework for common heritage because it is intentional about recognizing that expertise does not just exist in the library or in the academy or at the college it recognizes that there is a tremendous amount of expertise and knowledge that exists in the community. And so I saw this project as a meeting of the minds. Everyone is building, everyone is bringing something to the table. So, you know, we have the equipment, we have a certain, a certain kind of expertise, 
Um, but the community has the knowledge and they have the artifacts and they have information that we're not privy to. And so while what everyone brings to the table is different, um, what everyone brings to the table is also valuable. And so I think it's really important to put that out there and have that type of recognition. Another challenge for us was marketing. Um, when we wrote our uh, project uh, application, we anticipated that some of the more traditional marketing channels would be attractive to this um, project. So we thought that we could use things like social media and you know, some of the more traditional tools. And what we discovered was that the most effective marketing tool for us was word of mouth. And again, that kind of reinforces point number one about building trust. Um, word of mouth relationships were significant um, in this project in terms of getting the word out. And they were much more effective than any of the other um, marketing channels that we tried to use. The third challenge that I would say for us would be scheduling. And so we wanted this to be a balanced project and one in which um, we were considerate and respectful of the community and when community events took place. Um, we initially envisioned kind of piggybacking off of some of the neighborhood festivals that um, take place annually in the community. But it was kind of challenging for us to figure out when those were and to get our marketing out. So scheduling um, events proved to be a challenge. We also, um, this is a nice segue into point number four, uh, COVID-19 came up. So our original project completion date was uh, June 30th or is June 30th, but due to the pandemic, we had a couple of other events that we were just not able to carry out because of the campus being closed and because of social distancing. So I was able to work with um, our grants office recently and NEH uh, offered us an extension. So those couple of events you saw, like the community panel and the exhibits, those will um, hopefully take place before um, we're, we'll be able to get those off the ground by June 30th. And I'm very thankful to the National Endowment for the Humanities for um, giving us that extension. I would also add, and I didn't list it here, it was not necessarily a challenge, but I do want to acknowledge the project team. Um, we had uh, participation from people throughout the library who brought really diverse uh, skill sets into the project. So we had our digital archivist, Holly Croft, um, Evan Levitt, who you saw in one of the earlier pictures, um, our assessment librarian, LaMonica Sanford, um, helped us to do some surveys with the project. We brought on a new community archivist after the project started, Jessamine Swan. We had graduate assistants like Jarvis, um, Tanya, uh, Darden, Dave, and Daha. So just a wealth of broad participation from throughout the library. So opportun opportunities and lessons learned. The first one that I would say um, is just strategy, strategy, strategy. You really have to think through what you're going to do be purposeful and intentional in what you're going to do and, and be really thoughtful. Um, I would add that I am not from Millersville. While I am African-American, I'm not from Millersville. So a lot of the detailed community history was not known to me. However, um, I'm from Macon and uh, we have a large university here, Mercy University, that I'm very familiar with. Uh, my family is familiar with, my um, grandmother actually worked there. And so having that kind of background and context for what those town gown relationships can be like, I think was an asset for me in terms of thinking about strategy. So thinking about, you know, what it means to come on campus if maybe you haven't always been able to come on or maybe you haven't been welcome. And so, you know, the strategy for that was, okay, let's put these events out in the community. So again, just strategy, 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 um, even the thoughtfulness in terms of selecting the workshop participant, what kinds of connections, if she was gonna be unknown to them, what kinds of connections um, could she build through her lived experience or through her education? Um, secondly, just the value of diverse teams. And so again, we had a very diverse team from our uh, library. We pulled in people from across the library 
but also I would say that our community, um, I would call them our uh, griots, um, Mr. Bayman, um, Ms. Sandra Jones, um, several other individuals brought unique and valuable experience to this project. And so, again, everybody's experience is going to be different, but I think everyone's experience is value, uh, valuable. Uh, thirdly, the value of relationships. And so, you know, looking at the project initially, I thought that we would be doing the required project events and maybe having a couple of other conversations. But I personally have been very fortunate in the sense that I've built some really meaningful relationships. And I think I can speak for some of our other project participants with some of these community members that will transcend the dates of this project. And so we are operating out of a out of a relationship and it is also um, mutually beneficial. Um, the fourth and fifth items here kind of go together, the value of collaborations. And so again, I was attracted to this um, framework for the Common Heritage Project because it is, it has a collaborative spirit. And so it was never that we were doing something for the community. Um, it was not a, an asset-based approach. It was a very value-based approach in the sense that there was value in the community, there was history in the community, there is knowledge in the community, and so we're benefiting each other, and we're bringing different things to the table, but this ideally should be a collaboration. And then lastly, I would say the residual opportunities that have come forward. Um, because of the relationships that have been built out of this project. Um, we have some other activities at the college. For example, um, we have an exhibit that we had hoped to launch sooner, but it looks like it's not gonna launch until um, January of 2020 um, that deals with uh, local music. And so out of these relationships that were developed as a part of the Common Heritage Program, we've been able to tap into other areas of expertise and knowledge um, in the community. And so, again, it's not a one and done kind of thing. I think that my hope, of, of course, is that we are establishing trust with this project and that we will have future um, community collaborations um, in the future um, to open up some doors to us that maybe haven't been open um, in the past. And lastly, um, that is my email address and my telephone number. If you have any specific questions about this project, um, I think she was going to open it up for um, questions, questions now, but if you have questions afterwards, please let me know. Well, I want to um, take a moment to thank both Brenda and Chandra before we start taking uh, questions. Um, if you'll um, type your questions in the in the chat, um, that would be helpful. If you're uh, if you don't know how to find the chat, uh, drag your cursor down to the bottom of the, your screen, and then you'll see a little chat button. Um, you can also hit Alt H, and that will allow us um, to uh, allow us to um, see your chat question. Uh, it looks like Joy's got a question that's partially there. It says, what's uh, here? I will come back to you, Joy, because I think um, part of your question is missing. Um, from, I think this is Sean. Um, is the Rockdale Conyers Public Library still working on the scanning project? It sounds Hi. like an amazing endeavor. Okay. Hi, this is Brenda. To answer your question, it is yes and no. Um, we took a step back in all honesty because what we knew is that we needed to build stronger relationships in the community, do more of the um, um, bridge building, if you will, start and, and to really build relationships that foster trust. Um, I go back to that statement of when you're looking at um, documents that are people's um, <clears throat> history and, and 
you know, their sacred documents. We wanted to be able to really have that cultural competency to be able to speak the same language, to understand, to appreciate, and in many respects to learn. So the answer is yes, we do plan to embark on that right now. We're in a little bit obviously because of COVID, but we also have a major um, renovation project that's kind of paused. But what we have been doing to build those relationships is we've, um, grown our outreach or extension services department so that we can go out into the community. We have started doing um, workshops and um, classes with some of our seniors on just how to, you know, navigate technology, understanding the components, whether it's a computer or a scanner. And that is bearing really positive fruit as well as really putting ourselves out there um, in the community saying, here are our resources, this is what is available. So the, what we're seeing in terms of the outcome from the original project is more folks coming in, willing to use our technology. And we're just waiting for that moment when we feel it's appropriate to go back out. And again, with more of a framework that is clearly defined so that we're not trying to be all things at one moment inside the library. We want to make sure that we're specific on what we want to do, as well as I want to make sure that uh, the staff is up to speed on the tools that are available and how to use them. But thank you for your question. We have a question from Joy. Uh, what's the best way you found to reach out to the communities, to communities that you've not been in contact with before? How do you get them involved before hosting an event? I'll try to speak to that question. Um, I think I would recommend for anyone, before you engage in any project like this, if you know that you are, um, there's a specific need in your collection or there's an underserved population, that you uh, put forth the effort to connect with that population. Um, go to their meetings, um, invite them to your campus. Um, Sometimes the really casual and informal encounters can help to establish those relationships. Uh, prior to us applying for the Common Heritage Program, uh, the group of individuals that I spoke, spoke about, so um, Melvin Bayman, Sandra Jones, um, Ben Lewis, they were, uh, I got pulled into a conversation about doing some oral history interviews. Um, and so I already had that background and context and relationship with them. And we talked over a time period and we got to know each other. Uh, we talked about things that had absolutely nothing to do with oral history or this project or this grant. And so when the grant came up, it was like, okay, where can this fit into something that we're already doing? So that relationship was already there and it wasn't really a blind or cold call. So I would encourage anyone, again, who's interested in developing these types of projects, to go ahead and start nurturing those relationships in advance. Um, and again, I think too, I use them as a springboard and a sounding board for the grant application because I did not want to impose this project on the community. I wanted it to be something that the community wanted it to be so that we would have the buy-in that would be necessary to make it uh, successful. And so I think that also helped us along the way. Um, I actually concur with Chandra. Uh, I think it's really important to widen out your connections within the community. And um, since we took on the project, um, we again, I, I mentioned we had um, expanded our um, extension services or outreach department, and we are embedded in a host of local community agencies. Um, we go to meetings. It's a little bit easier in Rockdale County because we're relatively small. And it is really paying fruit. Um, I would have to say last summer, as a result of a lot of the outreach and really getting outside of the bricks and mortar and going into the community, we have closed that gap. As a matter of fact, the part of the um, success we've had has been in a lot of our other programs because now they're starting to appreciate 
what the library offers and they know faces and they're willing to call up and say, hey, we have this need here, can you help? We're all building toward our next event so that there won't be this surprise of, hey, the library is offering this and you come in and there's just not that connection. You're not meeting people where they're at. And that's our whole goal is the next time we go out and we start with our another project like this, we want to meet um, our community where they're at, where whatever their competencies are with digitization, we wanna be able to say, this is how you do it, very much a step action um, sort of process. So if someone comes in and wants to scan a picture, we want to be able to talk about how and why to get that out into the public sphere, as well as capture it and give it back to them to say, now you have something of your history, of your legacy. And so that it's really a win-win, not only for the library and sharing um, our community history, but also so that the customer or the user takes something away that they will have as part of their own personal archive. Uh, but that's a really good question. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from Felicia. Um, she asked Brenda and Chandra, was there an opportunity to capture any of the stories on video as people brought in their Bibles and during the Harris Heritage Harvest Days? I will say not from our end, we, we, that was never our intent actually, but no. And, and what I know to be true is, you know, with obviously with video, there's a lot of permission involved and all that kind of stuff. So we have not gone down that path yet. And same here, um, in our application, we focus on very specific kinds of artifacts. And so video was not a part of, um, it was not a, uh, type of um, artifact that we were looking to collect uh, with this project. Great. I see that um, Jothi D'Souza has a, a question or a comment. Um, if you could take a second to um, type it in the chat, um, we will um, ask it. I'm gonna, while I'm waiting for Jothi, I am gonna go to our next question. Um, this is from Gina. Um, do you intend to have follow-up events and will the um, programs continue as a series of community events? So thank you for your question, Gina. Um, our intent is to meet the grant requirements, we have to have two other events. One of those is going to be a community um, history panel, we'll be bringing in a humanities scholar, Dr. Don Hurd Clark, uh, formerly of Fort Valley State University. She's written um, a book about, or she's written about the Dorchester Academy, which was very significant to the African American school, the Eddy School in Milledgeville. So she'll be coming from Florida, and we hope to have our community griots on um, that panel along with her. We are also, um, another event will be exhibiting some of the materials from uh, the collection of items that were digitized. And unfortunately, just before we left campus, I was having a conversation with um, the uh, Sally Ellis Davis House about the possibility of um, doing some derivative uh, events to kind of spin off this project. So not uh, required or directly connected to, to it, but um, trying to capture some of the energy that came from it. And so hopefully we'll be able to bring those to fruition um, in the near future. I would say from the public library perspective, um, we definitely would like to, it is on our planning, um, our future plan strategically. And what we see is an opportunity, um, I, I use the term step action, is to go back and capture maybe in narrative form just the recording of telling your story because what happens in rockdale county is that we there's a lot of um gatherings if you will and often they are very or they're oral traditions and that's a familiarity that has obviously 
Um, it's a rich history with Black folks. And so we feel that sometimes to, to bridge that divide, you start out with the oral traditions. And, and part of this is building trust. And I'm just going to kind of circle around a little bit by saying that we have a law library in the public library, a little bit of a rare gem. And we started a law library series. And never could we have imagined the success of these programs. I mean, on a Saturday, we have folks coming out, you know, anywhere from 25 to 80, 88 people. It's a partnership with the courts. But the point of this is, in these series, they're all intimately linked to um, history. And while it's the focus is law, we're still hearing those stories about, you know, what happened to parents and grandparents and why this all matters. So we see that we have a wonderful opportunity to leverage our existing programs into something in the future. And they all harmonize together quite nicely. Thank you. So we still have a few uh, moments for questions, for comments. If we don't have any more questions, I want to heartily thank both Brenda and Chandra for um, coming to talk with us today. Um, you know, I would, one of the things that I like to say about digital projects is that it's, it's not the technology part that's the hard part, it's the people part and the relationships. So um, I think um, they both brought us lots of great knowledge and, um, and I really value uh, their um, input and um, their talks today. Um, I just want to do a couple little reminders before um, we end. Um, again, um, we've got the session tomorrow at 10 on um, digitization on a shoestring. Um, we'll also um, have that town hall on the 18th. We'd love to have you all attend. Um, if you're not, if you're unfamiliar with our town halls, um, sign up for our listserv uh, at DLG News at listserv.uga.edu. Um, we have a survey at the end. Um, if you take a few moments to um, answer that, it helps us. Um, it helps us design programs for um, for you all in the future. And I can't say I can't thank uh, Brenda and Chandra enough. And thank you all for attending. Thank you, Sheila, for the opportunity. <laughs>